So thanks so much for inviting me here, um, and thanks so much uh, for coming this evening, talking about this totally fascinating topic, which I just am completely excited to delve into. Um, as the introduction said, I'm a writer, a journalist, and I write about mostly about conservation and ecology. So uh, when we saw this slide there about the three domains in which this technology might be able to be used, I'm mostly going to talk about that green domain of the environment, um, dealing with endangered species, dealing with non-native species. Um, and what I'm really going to try to do is what I what I find most interesting is to look at those fields and try to figure out what the values that underlie those fields are in detail, which is something that the people who do the work of conservation and restoration and ecology don't always stop to do because they're so busy trying to save the planet that they don't stop to think exactly what they're trying to save and why. Um, but I am not an eth a professional ethicist, as I think that there are some professional ethicists among here today, so if I you know, stray from the kind of correct terminology of, of the philosophical version of ethics. Please forgive me, I'm an amateur uh, when it comes to that. But I do want to make a distinction between two kinds of value. Um, this sort of intrinsic value and instrumental value, as the philosophers say. So intrinsic value is something that's good just for what it is. It's good in and of itself. Um, and the kind of classic example is a human being or happiness. So here's a happy human being. Um, and uh, I chose a baby because it sort of uh, really pulls hard on our sense that this is a valuable thing. Um, if you see somebody drowning or a baby drowning, you rush and save them because they're valuable just for what they are, not for what they can do for you. And the classic example of instrumental value is money. Money by itself isn't really worth anything, it's just paper, but it's useful in what it can get you. Um, of course, most things, many things, are, are both instrument, I mean, there's quite a few things that are both instrumentally and intrinsically valuable. So if you're a student, your professor might fall into that category. She's valuable because she's a person, but she's also valuable because she's going to train you and make you worth more on the job market. Um, but we're going to stick with the intrinsic value for this investigation. I'm interested in what's really valuable about nature. What is it about the non-human world that is worth so much work to try to preserve? Why is it that we get so upset when it's destroyed? What, where is that value located? Um, so I'm going to talk about different levels in which we might find this value, different levels of organization. And I'm going to start with the sort of easiest case to make, which is that individual animals are valuable. So, they might not be as valuable as that happy baby, and definitely they're not, because that happy baby is my daughter, so I'm here to tell you that <laughs> nothing is as valuable as that happy baby. Um, but individual sentient animals are obviously have some kind of moral value. You, if you walk into a room and someone is torturing a puppy, you say to yourself, that's a bad thing that they're doing. Um, but this kind of value really rests on a lot of uh, the sentience of this creature, the fact that it has perhaps goals or purpose or intentions and that it can feel pleasure and pain. So it's a lot harder to make this case for something like a tree. Although, the more we learn about trees and how they can communicate to other trees and how they respond to their environment, um, the more we begin to think that this isn't maybe so clear that they don't have some kind of purpose direction. I mean, certainly when there's an opening in the canopy, they grow towards it. Whether they're sitting there thinking, ha ha, here's my, mo like my moment to make a move, or whether they just have the kind of response to their environment is a tricky uh, kind of decision to make. But individual animal sentience isn't actually really the concern of conservation often. Really, what they're often concerned with is species, right? Like, you don't get, uh, the World Wildlife Fund is not interested in the endangerment of an animal that's super common, like a, a groundhog somewhere is about to walk across the road and get squished, they're only interested in this if it's a panda that's about to walk across the road and get squished, because the panda is an endangered species. The tricky thing about valuing species and getting very upset when species go extinct is that species don't have that kind of sentience, ability to feel pleasure or pain, or even goal direction uh, that plant, I mean, that animals and potentially plants have, right? And they're just not, they're abstract concepts, and they're concepts that humans developed at some level. 
Nevertheless, species is where I think a lot of conservationists really think. That's sort of where, you know, we hear about the extinction, sixth grade extinction crisis. We, we hear about, uh, oftentimes we don't hear about a species until it's about to go extinct. Um, that's when all of a sudden we get worried about it because it's the sort of presence absence binary. If the species is present, that's good. If the species is absent, it's bad. Um, of course, focusing completely on species um, can be bad too because you could just have all the species alive, but they're all in zoos. Um, in fact, this is sort of the case with the tiger. There are actually more tigers in private collections in the United States than there are in the wild. Um, and when I tell you that, I don't think you're like, yay, lots of tigers in private collections. Your response is probably something like, ugh, that's a shame. Because we don't want them in little boxes. We want the species to be interacting with each other on the level of ecosystems. And so that's the next level up in the hierarchy. And I think ecosystems, if species is a lot easier to measure, and so maybe a lot of conservation uh, assessments about where is the biodiversity hotspots and things like that focus on species, it's ecosystems where we really get that nature feeling. We don't get that when we just look at one species uh, in isolation. So this is uh, from the work of Suzanne Samard, and these little green guys are Douglas firs, and all the connections between them are mycorrhizal fung fungi underneath the ground that's connecting them all su in such a complex way that nutrients and information flow from tree to tree. The tree with the little, um, do I have a zip? Oh, it's kind of faint there. But this little guy here with the arrow has f is connected to 47 other trees underground by this fungal network. And there's something like three different species of fun fun fungus at work here. And I think that if you took this picture and you dapped all the fungus and it was just 47 trees, we would feel that there was some kind of loss of value there. The sort of complex network, the, c the connections, the relationships seem to hold some value. You know, the, the predation, the parasitism, the mutualisms, all those complicated relationships. And of course, that's a really difficult thing to try to pin down as far as having value because how do you capture the relationship between two species? Um, that's not a th an entity that has interests. It's a relation between two entities or two species. And so it gets kind of, as the things seem to get more valuable, they seem to also get more abstract and less easy to kind of capture. Um, so then when you add genes to this picture, you end up with the sort of what I would say like the total picture of this concept of biodiversity. And genes are important to have here too because you know you don't want all of your cheetahs to be genetically identical. You want some genetic diversity in there so they have adaptability to changing conditions. And even not for a kind of a pragmatic adaptionist way, reason, you want your species to have variation within them. Uh, you want some, you know, some of your uh, lodgepole pine to be tall and straight and some of your lodgepole pine to be smart. Oh, actually, that's not genetic. That's phenotypic, isn't it? Um, but you want to have variation. If everything is exactly the same, it's not as good. So here's biodiversity. Um, and this looks very satisfying, and I sort of want to stop here and sort of say, this is what is valuable, and let's all go have a drink. Um, but unfortunately, it's all of these categories are leaky. None of these are uh, kind of easy to pin down. Individuals possibly the most, but even individuals can be complicated. Here's a, a beautiful lichen from my home state of Oregon. Lichens are kind of a com co like a communist organism in which the the uh, algae and the fungus work together and form a kind of a kind of a functioning unit. So from from these kinds of things to many many kinds of microorganisms, even pinning down what is an individual can be tricky. Um, and then when we move to species, there's all kinds of, well, in fact they call it the species problem. Um, and my, my sort of typical example that I used to always give was the polar bear because back in 2007 when I last wrote about this, the polar bear was firmly nested within all the brown bears in every kind of genetic tree that they'd done of it, suggesting that in fact it's just kind of like a really pale grizzly bear. Um, but I wanted to make sure that was still the case. These things are often uh, moving targets, so I did a little polar bear phylogeny lit survey, and in fact now it's not, no one's totally sure, and, and the latest, this is even a preprint um, uh, from uh, SUNY Buffalo, the, the lab on bear genetics. And this is the, the blue is the polar bear, the brown is the brown bear. So 
uh, there's a lot of introgression, and it's not ne so it's actually even less clear now whether the polar bear is its own sort of outgroup clade or whether it is just kind of a fancy kind of uh, brown bear. Um, but even if it is a fancy kind of brown bear, we don't want to see all of the fancy brown bears disappear. We still want polar bears. So I think it's worth noticing and admitting that at some level, when we say we don't want species to go extinct, what we mean is we don't want morphologically distinct units, um, especially morphologically distinct units that make good stuffed animals to go extinct. Um, and then, of course, ecosystems. And this tearing down this notion that ecosystems are, are an entity is basically what I've been doing professionally for the past 10 years. Um, so I won't belabor this point. I'll just tell you to go buy my book and read about it for further detail. But uh, here's your sort of standard Clemencian notion of an ecosystem. There's a disturbance that goes through successional changes. And then you get the climax, the, in this case, the oak hickory forest. And that um, ecosystem is the correct ecosystem. It is a whole. It is, in his original notion, it is almost organism-like. Um, but then this is the guy who kind of, this is uh, Henry Gleason, the anti-Clements, who argued, and I think pretty correctly, that although ecosystems are complicated, interwoven, uh, and often interdependent, in the grand scheme of things, they are sort of accidental conglomerations of species. If you look at it through history, uh, Stephen Jackson's done some work suggesting that there are no kind of uh, plant associations in North America that are old, older than about 12,000 years. So every ecosystem type that you might know and love, whether it's a juniper, sage, scrub, or whether it's an old growth cedar, hickory, I mean, uh, hemlock forest, um, that is something that's relatively new on a sort of a geological time scale. Um, so given that there aren't any real uh, correct states for ecosystems, operationally, restorationists and, and conservationists tend to go with the first white dude heuristic, um, which is whatever the first Westerner who came to the place and wrote down what the species composition and function was, that's the right state of that ecosystem. Um, so for every, every kind of colonized place has its own white guy, um, even within units in the West, we often have Lewis and Clark. Um, and even down on a very granular level, I gave a talk in Dayton, Ohio, and I found out that their official county definition of a native plant for their county was a plant that was present the day that this guy showed up. Um, and he was the first white guy in the Dayton area. His name was Ebenezer Zane. Um, and I think once you get down to the Ebenezer Zane, you start to realize how ridiculous this is as an ecological tool. Um, apart from anything else, it completely erases indigenous land management, uh, both intentional and unintentional. There's a lot been writ written about it lately, and more and more is coming out, and I hope it gets more recognized. Some of it uh, has to do with hunting seasons and hunting areas, a lot of burning. Um, in California, there was also a lot of sort of quasi, you know, kind of agriculture in the sense that certain plants were promoted and moved and harvested on a regular basis, but they weren't in these neat little rows. And so when white people got there, they couldn't recognize it for the manipulation of the environment that it was. Um, this is a great book, which I highly recommend, but I also just adore the title um, because it really gets at this tension between this notion that this, what people saw when they showed up as colonists was a wilderness and the fact that it had been probably tended um, and of course, you know, if you go downstairs and take a look at uh, some of the holdings in the mammal room, um, there's quite a few large mammals there that no longer exist in North America, thanks probably, in, at least in part, to the first humans who got here. In fact, I highly recommend you check out the ground sloth they have down there because it's so recent that there's still hair on it, uh, which is pretty badass. Um, so, Let's just also take a look at another important value that shows up in conservation, and that is, broadly speaking, naturalness. Um, biodiversity, all biodiversity is not created equal. Um, if you want it to be valued, there must be, at some level, a sense of naturalness about it. I interviewed the ethicist Ronald Sandler at Northeastern University, and he is, he, the way he puts it is, is that the source of the biodiversity matters. So, 
Um, we have come up with all these names, all these categories for, for good biodiversity and bad biodiversity, natural biodiversity and unnatural biodiversity. And again, I mean, the other half of my work is basically um, trying to suggest that the natural biodiversity is over, um, that we're living in a world that has been so thoroughly influenced by human beings that what we basically are left with is this stuff, and we better get used to it and learn how to love this stuff. Um, and, and I think that that, you may think that I'm making a pretty strong case there to suggest that all the natural stuff is over, but, but let's look at a couple of these levels. So, so the genes, um, I think it's probably fair to say that almost every species on the planet has had some kind of evolutionary level pressure that's been applied by the fact that they live in a world dominated by humans. And it's interesting to see how those kind of genetic changes that flow from living in a human, humanized world are characterized as, as far as value goes. So to take a forestry example, um, if you've got a tree that uh, is dealing with climate change and that tree uh, has some genetic changes that allow it to survive and thrive on slightly less water, um, that tends to be celebrated as a good thing. Those genetic changes are sort of nature fighting back against um, the negative things that we've done to the environment. So even though ultimately those genetic changes are anthropogenic, they're considered to be good because all we did was hurt the organism and then watch it adapt, or the species. Um, if we were to take some trees from further south or a hotter part of the species range and then move the seeds from those trees into a place that was experiencing rapid climate change to kind of introduce some of those drought tolerant genes and help that gene pool have the material that it needed in order to deal with the change, that's borderline. We're taking, we're taking kind of natural genes, but we're moving them. This is something that they've done in British Columbia. They've started moving their seed stock when they do replanting in forestry further, further up, up altitude and, and further north in order to bring that kind of adaption. And people are broadly in favor of it, especially seeing as it's plantation forestry and people have lower expectations for how natural it's going to be. But uh, it still skeeves people out a little bit. Um, but then if you were to genetically engineer the tree to become more drought tolerant, you're going to lose a lot of people at that point. A lot of people are no longer going to find what you've done acceptable. I mean, in all three cases, you're dealing with sort of anthropogenic genetic change. Uh, if you look at a couple of these other levels, the individual's level is one that I also find quite interesting. Um, the Stuart Brand quote uh, that we saw about an obligation to the natural world to restore what has been done to it, it runs into what the philosopher Claire Palmer calls the identity problem. I think she didn't coin that, but, but she, she uses that terminology in her work. All, all the organisms that are on this planet now are only here because of the changes that the humans made. So the little squirrels running around, um, it's hard to imagine that if we hadn't killed off all the mastodons, they would, those exact same squirrels would be here. The eco, ecological changes that followed the removal of the megafauna, you know, uh, turned grasslands into forests, changed forest composition, radically changed the face of the entire continent. Probably all the individual plants and animals that are here now are the legacy of those changes. And so how can we owe them anything when they in fact owe us their very existence. It gets tricky. Um, species is, is one that um, definitely most species that, are, uh, um, that exist today are not, they don't exist because of humans, but they're definitely being changed by humans. And we have made a few, that in fact, uh, as we sit around talking about killing off mosquito species, we managed to make a new mosquito species in the London underground, which only lives down there, uh, which is pretty awesome. And uh, novel ecosystems, I don't know how many of you have heard the term, but the novel ecosystem is basically just the ecosystem whose structure or function has changed so much because of anthropogenic forces that it's kind of new. And, you know, I'm here to tell you that given another couple generations, it's all going to be novel ecosystems, especially with climate change. So how am I doing on time? When, when do you want me to wrap up? Okay. So let's talk about how this kind of, this the kind of, I've, you know, I've summarized all the values in conservation here, <laughs> not exactly, but the, how this kind of plays out in some test interesting cases. And one thing that I wanted to point out is that this, this line that I've drawn down between natural and unnatural biodiversity is really more of a continuum. Um, this is the Pacific rat. It's a, that's not the Latin name for it anymore. Now it's um, ratus excellens, I believe. 
but it's called in Maori the kiori. Um, and if you go to New Zealand, which is trying to eradicate all of its non-native predators by 2050, you'll find that nobody cares if you kill Norway rats. But once you start killing these guys, people get a little upset because they didn't get brought there by the Europeans, they got brought there by the Polynesians. And they were brought there intentionally, and they were part of their culture, and they are recognized in their stories and in their art. And they're called the Kiori, which just obviously makes them sound a lot more valuable than the Norway rat. So the Department of Conservation has to con do a kind of a big cultural consultation every time they want to kill these guys. And yet they do often get permission to do so. And so the way I figure it, this is a half native species. It's not, a invasive, it's not as invasive as a Norway rat, but it's not as native as you know, a kiwi. Um, a lot of times, interest, what I find are the most interesting stories in conservation and what are the kind of ethically tr challenging ones are when our values for these different parts of this little map uh, c conflict with each other. So I think a really, a one that happens all the time and that's pretty easy for conservationists to reconcile is when um, a, a kind of a nice native species is being threatened by, a non, by individuals from a non-native species. So here's an example of the albatrosses on a lot of different islands. This is uh, Go Island or Gao Island. And um, these are house mice who just climb on the backs of the, of the chicks and suck their blood. Um, it's pretty horrible. And, and I think that, and so they're going to kill these mice. And raise your hand if you've got a problem with that. Um, <laughs> I think the fact that this is such a horrifyingly unnatural looking predation also really helps with the social acceptance on this one. But, you know, there's plenty of mice, they're not rare, and they're not native to this island, so people don't, generally speaking, have much of a problem with getting rid of them. Um, it gets a little trickier when you've got a conflict between species and individuals that are both native. Um, this is the case with the spotted owl, barred owl controversy, and if you um, haven't heard about this, so it's right, I'm out east, so maybe you guys haven't. Out west, this is a very hot topic, but the spotted owl, as you might recall from the 1990s, is uh, an endangered species that needs old growth forest and lots of other kind of very specific ecosystem requirements in order to live. The barred owl uh, was an eastern species that was pretty closely related, but it has started to encroach upon the territory of the spotted owl. And the barred owl, I don't know, you can kind of tell, he looks like kind of badass compared to the spotted owl, is a lot better at being an owl in those ecosystems and tends to displace the spotted owl. Now the tricky part about this is that it's not like some people came to the west from the east on boats and they accidentally had barred owls in their bilge water. Um, they, the barred owl got over there sort of on its own. Um, is this anthropogenic? Is it because of climate change? Is it because of telephone poles? This was one theory that, that because of these, these long lines of telephone poles that, that crossed the Great Plains, the, the owl was, a, was able to make it from one end of the country to the other. But it's still unclear whether this movement is natural or unnatural. In the meantime, they're doing such a good job at displacing the spotted owls that they're starting to shoot the, bar the barred owls out where I live. Um, so they've decided, at least for the moment, that um, species is more important than individuals in this case. Um, another good example of this would be the, the aerial gunning of wolves to save the woodland caribou in Canada. Um, in that case, uh, they're both native species, and in that one's also really unpopular with the public because wolves are very popular with the public. Um, and, you know, if they really wanted to save the woodland caribou, they should stop drilling for oil and gas and building roads and other linear features through the woods, but seeing as they're not going to do that, they're going to kill wolves. Um, and I wanted to stop here really briefly and just say that just because the conservation community has decided that it's sometimes okay to kill things in order to save things doesn't mean that you should just kill them any old way. Um, if you don't, just because you have higher ethical obligations to something else doesn't mean you have no ethical obligations to the species, to the individuals that you're going to remove. And this was a recent uh, paper in conservation biology, which I thought was interesting because I feel that conservation has for a long time been somewhat reluctant to moderate its uh, tools when it comes to removing non-natives um, because it's tricky, it's hard to do, and oftentimes the most effective methods are the most brutal. In the case of 
those mice and rat eradications on Pacific Islands, they often use anticoagulant poisons, which basically cause the animal to internally bleed to death over the period of about 10 days. Um, really not the best way to go. And frankly, if they can figure out how to make them only have sons, I can imagine that that would be a much more humane way to go out. Um, although, I, I gotta think all those males, <laughs> there could be some serious aggression issues. Um, Anyhow, so this, if, you, if your work involves killing things, I highly recommend checking this paper out. It talks a lot about um, w better ways to do it and ways to try to at least start thinking about doing it uh, better. Um, other uh, situations, and this I think is the most pertinent to the kind of question of doing genetic modification on natural things, require us to decide whether we're going to save something by making it unnatural or not save it at all. And so the kind of ultimate question here is like, which is worse, crossing this horrible line or disappearing completely? Um, in some cases, we have decided that hybridizing things in order to save them is acceptable. The Florida panther was about to go out, and so conservationists made the decision to import some Texas panthers to give them a much needed genetic rescue. And the peregrine falcon uh, that you see flying around is actually the result of a very um, intentional breeding program where they took, I believe it was something like 14 subspecies of peregrine falcon and, and mixed them all together in this kind of raptor cocktail and then let them out. Um, and what's interesting about that program was that not all of them were even North American species. Some of them were even European species. So the peregrine falcons that we see today are very cosmopolitan. Um, but it was considered acceptable to do that to give them enough genetic diversity in order to thrive in the wild. Um, here's this chestnut, uh, uh, the chestnut project uh, that Bill Powell is working on again. Um, I, Ronald Sandler, the ethicist from Northeastern, says, and I think I agree with him, that the public is going to be most accepting of using actual transgenic, actual genetic engineering in environmental situations if it's conceptualized as a cure, if it's conceptualized as a kind of medicine for a disease or a problem, undoing a very specific, very discreet, bad thing that happened to the species. And the uh, chestnut blight falls into this category. Um, this isn't a CRISPR program. This is, uh, I think they use a regular old agrobacterium for this guy. But uh, it is, does involve using a wheat gene. Um, and they're having some success with it. Um, this is some interesting research. And I think tomorrow we're going to hear more about this sort of social license research and, and what we're no learning about what the public actually thinks about all this. But the, this is an interesting um, bit of research um, coming out of, I think, at Oregon State University about um, what the public, who's blue, and the experts, who are gold, because, you know, they're, they're worth more, um, what they think about these different strategies for, deal for manipulating trees. And this last section is the genetic modification. As you can see, people are just um, much happier to do genetic modification f to, f to cure the blight. Well, much is putting it kind of, uh, those aren't huge differences. But they're happier to, do, to deal with, uh, genetically modified to deal with blight than they are to just make bigger trees so that we can make better timber. Um, so moving from the probably more acceptable to the crazier, um, heat tolerance and other climate change related uh, modifications. This is the pica. It's a, rela a relative of the rabbit. I once called it, a, when I was a very green reporter, I called it a rodent in one of my stories. And um, I got like 400 emails. Um, <laughs> But it is a high altitude specialist. It really cannot handle heat. And so it's sort of trapped up on all these mountaintops. And it can't, you know, sort of the options seem to be to either move it to mountains that are further north or potentially give it a genetic boost so they can handle uh, hotter temperatures. I think that this could be framed in a way where it seems like this is kind of like the chestnut blight. It's kind of uh, a cure for the climate change disease. Um, but I think it will be less. Um, less socially accepted. And, but on the other hand, it is also probably invisible. It'll still probably look exactly 100% as cute after the transformation, and that would probably help with acceptability. Um, the next case would be uh, rhinoceroses or other, um, so the idea here would be that you would use CRISPR to remove the horn of the rhino so that poachers would have no incentive to kill them. 
Um, and in fact, I've talked to Kevin Asphalt about whether you could program it such that the horn would then come back after a set number of generations. And he was like, totally. <laughs> so, you know, you could just kind of do your research and figure how long would it take for the market for rhino horn to completely extinguish. And then you could put those horns right back on. Um, I think this would be a tougher sell because the, rose, the transformation would be uh, externally visible. And then we have the Australian problem. Um, Australia has a ton of endangered marsupials and little mammals that are just wonderful, fascinating creatures. And all, of, like just dozens of them are threatened by exotic foxes and cats which have covered the continent and which are in, in probably any kind of short-term scenario impossible to remove. The only way that they keep these things alive now is by building these small enclosures where they can keep these animals inside and keep these non-native predators out. These are incredibly expensive. They require continual monitoring. And they're basically like jails for wildlife. There's a very, un, you know, there, it doesn't seem like the wilderness here. So um, my uh, husband, Yasha Rower, who's a philosopher, has a paper coming out suggesting that we cognitively enhance these animals, making them smart enough to deal with these predators. Because the problem with this little bilby and the numbats and, and, and the quolls and all of these great creatures is that they're just not evolutionarily equipped to deal with these really smart predators. And they just look at them and go, ooh, and then just get totally slaughtered. Um, in fact, there is a, pro I'm not sure if it's still on, but it, for a while at least, and it may still be running for all I know, there was this insane, well, beautiful, you know, crazy like a fox, uh, well, it's a bad example in this case, but there was this very interesting project in which they had an enclosure, they put a bunch of bilbies in it, and they put in one cat. And then they would wait until the cat had killed 95% of the bilbies. And then they would remove the cat and allow the bilbies to reproduce. And then they would put the cat back in. They were trying to evolve the ability to not get killed by the cat. They're trying to accelerate that evolution by setting up this like Bilby Thunderdome. Um, and Yash's argument is that if you just genetically modify them to be a little bit smarter, you could save a hundred generations of death at the sharp end of a claws of, of a cat. So I think this would be a pretty tough smell, sell. Um, I was actually talking to my editor at Wired about this. And he was like, are you crazy? Like, what do you want to do next? Give them opposable thumbs? Like, have you seen ever any science fiction? Never make them smarter. Um, which is a good point, I think. Um, and I think, but I think that even less acceptable potentially among conservationists uh, than making bilbies smarter would be modifying the natural world for our own benefit. Um, so I remember talking to Jack Schultz at the University of Missouri in Columbia about uh, using uh, genetic engineering to make plants into bioindicators of, of toxic situations, so bad soil or bad air. So you could, for example, plant these Shasta daisies by the side of the highway, and when the ozone level got too high, they would all turn pink. And then you would know that it wasn't safe to have your kids run and play outside. Um, frankly, there's a part of me that finds this really irresistible. Um, but and I think in the conservation world, though, this would be seen as less, uh, less acceptable than, than messing with something to save it. Now, in the broader public, because these are plants and not animals, and you're not making them smarter, giving them opposable thumbs, this might actually be more acceptable. Um, I just wanted to end by saying that I'm not proposing that we do any of this stuff. I'm not giving it my ringing endorsement. I'm just a reporter. I don't make ethical decisions. I just probe other people's ethical values. But there is um, a cost to, I guess to put it a different way, you, there is actually no non, there is no null response, right? You, if you have a decision about whether or not to use genetic engineering on a species that is threatened, it's not like you can't choose not to engage because all of the environmental problems we have loosed upon the world. So if you decide not to do something and the species go ex goes extinct, that blood is pretty much on your hands. You can't say, well, I just didn't engage, I just didn't decide. Not doing the genetic modifications also an in intervention or what it does is it allows the interventions of climate change, uh, land use change and so on to prevail. 
This is the dusky seaside sparrow. I don't know if, how many of you know this story. But uh, back in the 1980s, it, somebody, they, were, they were developing Florida at a breakneck pace. They were draining wetlands and putting up uh, you know, theme parks and all that kind of stuff. And then somebody noticed that this subspecies of sparrow was suddenly very scarce on the ground. And so they went and rounded up all the ones they could find, and they had a problem. All the surviving ones were males. So their choice, or was they all females? They were all one of the other. So their choice was uh, they could hybridize the dusky seaside sparrow males that were remaining with another related subspecies, thereby at least saving some of those genes in living populations, or they could do nothing. And the Fish and Wildlife Service basically said, we don't do hybrids. So they did nothing, and it went extinct, and it's gone. So we have a lot of hard, difficult choices to make, but as we make them, we must remember that deciding not to intervene is also a kind of intervention. Thanks so much. Um, something I've been thinking a lot about recently, I think we talked about this last time I met with you, Laz, um, and you brought this up too, is you know, a technology that might seem very unnatural, changing genetic sequence of something, can actually perhaps result in solutions that can be a much more natural solution um, on a larger scale. So um, the idea of being able to release animals um, that have been modified as opposed to using huge, you know, really poisonous chemicals to eradicate them. And I wondered if you could maybe just expand again about this, these levels of naturalness and sort of how, you know, what's sort of required of, of us to think about these things in that way. Go ahead. I have a thought. Maybe I'll go with you. Should have to go. So I think the black-footed ferret one is a good example of this because as it is now, they have to, they have to dose these guys every year right. to deal with the plague. And if they were able to modify them to produce their own endogenous plague, then they would never have to mess with them again. So um, the intervention would allow the individual ferrets to lead a much more wild life. And I think that there's, you know, because it depends on how purist you are about your definition of wild, but my sense is that something is wild five minutes after the last intervention. So you could rewild the ferrets pretty quickly after you taught them how to make their own plague vaccine. So the other part of that, inter the intervention, or another way in which it's, it's happening is, a, just, I have an undergrad just finishing up in, in my lab, and she's doing an internship with Arizona Game and Fish um, this coming, coming summer. And the other way to go at this is to vaccinate the prairie dogs. So they're re releasing uh, basically medicine to try to vaccinate the prairie dogs so that when they're preyed on by the ferrets, then ah, you, I you, like that. You, cut the, you cut the line of transmission think, as far as the ferrets mm, are concerned. Yeah, because aren't they using like Reese's Pieces or something right now? Uh, I don't know. Like peanut butter meats? To, to do it. So, um, but to get back to your point, you, you, your question, you, uh, what fascinates me about these cases and what ultimately, what pulled me into e the whole area of ecological ethics about eight years ago are, are these conflicting values the way in which you, you wind up with one obvious good, um, diminishing the disease burden on, on populations of humans, and, and one obvious good, as far as the conservation community is concerned, avoiding, avoiding extinction. And those values just clash right, right against each other when mm -hmm. the good, as far as the humans are concerned, is, at least some humans are concerned, is the extinction of the species, which is bad as far as other humans are concerned. And uh, reconciling those is, is really, really tough. It suggests that you would, in terms of the science, as you think about the science of it, um, look for an intervention that doesn't result in the extinction of the mosquito. And I don't know of anybody who's planning to go in that particular route right now. But think of other kind of interventions where you put genes in that um, diminish its capacity to transmit the plasmodium which is the invertebrate that's responsible for the malaria. Yeah, uh, and, and so you bring up a good point, actually, and I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, partly what's exciting and can be exciting about this 
CRISPR technology is that it's so targeted and so sophisticated. Um, so something we'll also be talking about is, you know, maybe not doing these sort of sledgehammer approaches of driving something to extinction, but being able to use this technology in a way that we can actually come up with really sophisticated solutions that are much more humane. Um, again, and might be more... Uh, which, which is where the basic research comes in on... on and yeah, and that is why we need projects, to... Mm -hmm. Even, as I mentioned with um, um, uh, Beth Shapiro, the notion that by the basic research associated with bringing back a mammoth, although not likely to be successful, not going to be successful, you learn an awful lot about the basic biology of these organisms, how you can then intervene in terms of other species mm -hmm. um, relative to conservation. Mm -hmm. Also, I just wanted to point out on the mosquito things, have you seen that that in the Italian lab where they were trying to put the gene drive in that they're starting to get some kind of resistance from these mosquitoes. They're trying to get a little bit of um, evolution is a powerful, powerful thing. So when you make things uh, you know, less fit, it'll come up with some very creative ways around that. Around it. So if, if we were giving these talks just in over in ecology and evolution, and especially my talk, the, the hands would go up and say, Jim, what about natural selection? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about the pushback from selection in terms of um, these manipulations? And that's absolutely right. One of the challenges in getting these kinds of technologies to work is to get them to be stable and be able to move through these populations in the way that you, that you would like them to do. Now, we know that happens. We know about selective sweeps in which you do get a new gene up and it does get going in terms of populations, and the question is, what are the conditions under which that works, and how might you mimic those conditions if you were doing it with a gene drive? Thank you. So I wanted to open up uh, to the audience if there's questions. Um, anyone wanted to join the conversation? We've got one here. Hi. Very intriguing. Um, Perhaps you could, everyone could introduce themselves uh, as well, I'm so we can Alan, know who everyone uh, is. I'm a uh, conservation um, commissioner in Newington, Connecticut. So, I'm going to change, I'm going to play devil's advocate. We talk about disease and eradicating species, you know, invasive species, animals, plants. What about genetically modifying humans? <laughs> so that we can deal with these diseases. <laughs> I like that idea. Big thoughts. <laughs> we experiment on ourselves first. But I don't think we should. <laughs> uh, so I'll take the out in terms of with, with our report that we did, which was non-humans. I'll say that was not part of the <laughs> Warrant as far as the report is concerned. Um, I understand they are, are, I mean, there's some clinical trials already going on that are using similar technologies and not in malaria, I don't think, but in some other diseases. Um, so we may be doing this kind of research on ourselves already. Well, I guess I'm not, you can, so you, you don't mean vaccination? I mean vaccination. No. Just make it so, yeah, make us like the prairie dogs, like we, we pump up, we make our own malaria vaccine. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, you link it to a photo period gene. So when you go to the tropics, it turns on. <laughs> you really thought about this. No, I just made that up. Just now. <laughs> um, so there, there's a whole other group of individuals. So our charge, to actually be serious on the point, was to look at non human organisms. But there's no, there are other groups that are looking at um, human germline alterations. And that is a whole other uh, another story. I mean, they're relatable. There's no doubt about it. But the questions that go along with human germline editing, as opposed to somatic cell editing, uh, where you have the dead end in terms of the one individual, uh, they're really it's really a different issue. A really different issue. I I think you bring up an uh, interesting point though, because it seems like through you know. There's always this situation where, at the end of the day, nature is the one that has to suffer or go through the changes, you know, and, and malaria is a really good example and, and other infectious diseases where we have social conditions that are increasing these diseases that are contributing to their spread and we're, we don't want to change that or we're not putting money to, you know, have enough money to change that, but we'll go and kill the mosquitoes so that we don't have to make those changes. And so that is, you know, that is an interesting and important thing, I think, to keep in mind.
So uh, in, the, uh, in the report that we did, that falls under the whole area of ecological risk assessment. And uh, you asked just the right questions. How much do you, what do you need to know and with what confidence before you're willing to go ahead in this precautionary sense that I illustrated um, in order to introduce these organisms? It's hard to be general. In fact, it's impossible to be general because the decisions are likely to be context dependent. You really need to know the particularities about the ecosystems in which you're working and the organisms that are there in order to develop the models to make the predictions as to exactly how these newly modified genetic organisms are going to be behaving under those circumstances. So the short answer is uh, context dependence, uh, models, uh, reducing risk to the greatest degree that you can as you work through these situations, uh, run the experiments in a series of completely closed laboratory conditions, uh, con contain conditions in the field, and gradual release as you go along to see whether or not you can control it. What about the plants animals part of the question? Uh, at one point, you can agree in terms of plants being less, less mobile, but on the other hand, they've got pollen and can go really long distances. And so I'm loath to generalize in terms of plants versus animals. I think that as far as social acceptability, uh, people generally will be more weirded out by modifying animals than plants because uh, popular culture and the fact that we relate more with animals than we do with plants and so on. Um, and I think the fact that plants are so genetically weird to begin with with all their polyploidy and their incredible diversity and I don't know, I just, I imagine the social acceptability would be. Oh. One thing that I, I think is interesting about the ecological risk assessment that, that, that one would have to do is, it's, you know, if, if people really want to do this technology and want to throw money at it, we might be able to get some, some careful characterizations of ecosystems beyond what we've been able to get so far. And there might be this side benefit yeah. of just, just being able to get of spurring really them. De mm -hmm. detailed understandings of these ecologies. Like, frankly, my long game might be like to try to get one of those grants just because that, that would be so much fun to just Enjoy. really describe the whole, you know, the whole ecosystem. Uh, Stephen? I'm, I'm Steve Lathan. I'm the director of the Biological Center here. I worry, especially with regard to the extinction, but also with regard to sort of proposed modifications to different species to help them deal with global warming. I have the same worry about this that I have about geoengineering, which is that it will defuse our worry about mm -hmm. climate change and about our responsibility for all this issue. It makes things seem fixable. It makes seem, things seem less permanent. Even extinction isn't forever. Um, mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you think about the political consequences of trying to have a more public conversation about this when it seems to be kind of a little bit Morally hazardous? Morally hazardous, exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. So it is a debate, an active debate within the conservation community um, with uh, de-extinction uh, being questioned along the lines that you're suggesting. Also the notion of it taking resources away from conservation activities that are look more certain mm -hmm. in some sense. but the argument there is that the resources that are currently going into the extinction efforts are coming from private sources, individuals mm -hmm. who are putting funds there that they would not necessarily put into conservation under other sort of circumstances, but this is, this is so bright and so shiny and so interesting if it were to work that it's a way in which some individuals want to, want to invest funds. So. Um, the answer is that it is an area of lively debate, and the point that you raise is a, is a fair one in terms of um, does it just put us again on this slippery slope where you don't have to quarry quite so much if something does go extinct because you might be able to bring it back. I would just add that, you know, in terms of, there's, there's two different questions. One is should we make this, oper if we make it operational such that we can bring things back or we can 
uh, change the climate, or we have already done a few species, or we have already changed the climate, that would create this moral hazard. But then the other way that you seem to frame it was, should we even be talking about this in public? And I think that the, my answer to that second question is absolutely we should be talking about this in public because um, there's already a perception among many members of the public that scientists are not trustworthy and that scientists are not frank with the public and that um, they don't believe in climate change because, you know, what do these eggheads know? And so keeping conversations away from the public seems to me like a really bad move. Um, I think that we need to just be intellectually honest with each other. Um, so in my other work where I talk about the pervasive human impacts on ecosystems and how there, there's not these pristine places, people always worry that if I say this out loud, then developers will be like, well, if it's not pristine, then we can just, mm -hmm. you know, we can just bulldoze it. Um, and so they want me to just, just talk a little more quietly. And, and I just think that's, um, uh, it's underestimating the ability of the public to deal with complicated issues and it's risking sounding like, like the elite scientists are keeping something from, from from the world. Yeah. I would agree with that completely. I, I, these debates need to be open. That's why we emphasize public engagement so much in our report that we think that this is really awfully important and to uh, work through these issues. Transparency would be important. Um, we have time for one more very, very quick question. We're, we'll all be together um, at, in the cocktail hour so you can ask people individually um, if you'd like to finish us off. I was going to go see a therapist about this, but since you're here, <laughs> <laughs> so I started out as a field biologist having fun and you know, exploring stuff, and then somewhere along the line, I go, I have to go to the power of medicine, I have to cure diseases and stuff like that. And then, <laughs> oh gosh. And I feel bad, that's why I'm Yeah, no, I, I think that there I think that from an ethical perspective, the question before us has to be how given the population projections, how can we save other species and wild places and have a healthy, thriving life for everybody else? Um, and that, part of that answer can be offering people who don't currently have options to, for birth control, those kinds of options. But I, you know, the, the notion that the solution to our problems is to uh, slash the human population or that we should all, I mean, or that we shouldn't be trying to, to solve health problems, I think is pretty ethically a non-starter, I would argue. Right, I, I think we, we just have to be willing to reach in and help these populations, for example, that are burdened by, by these infectious diseases. The challenge then is, is how do you do it? What is the context? What are the larger issues that you build around those kinds of programs in order to keep the, um, the larger perspective in front of you in terms of, well, as I indicated at the end, this world that is a series of pieces and we're trying to put it together as well as we can as we're the dominant organism growing faster and occupying uh, more of it and using more of the resources. How do we balance yeah. that? And those 425,000, 438,000 people who die of malaria every year probably have an environmental footprint smaller than this room. So mm -hmm. that's good to keep in mind too. Well, thank you um, for a great discussion and a great uh, series of, of talks and um, for joining us. And we'll all be moving down now to the Great Hall where all the dinosaurs are, which are extinct, um, <laughs> to have some drinks and we can continue this chat. And again, we hope we see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at Rosenfeld Hall. <laughs>